All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the King's Chapel. If you could find your seats again. We're blessed with a lot of children at the King's Chapel. Amen? Takes a minute for them to, uh, to be able to get out in an orderly fashion. Well, it's such a joy to be with you this morning. If you're a visitor, a guest with us, we want to especially welcome you and just so glad that you could come out and join us on this beautiful fall day. Who's happy we've had some sunshine recently again after that rainy spell, right? All right, so this morning I do have the pleasure of launching in to a new series, but I want to exercise our imaginations a little bit this morning with a story that's very familiar, but let's try to put it into our context before we dive into the scriptures that we're going to look at this morning. There's so much here for us, but I want you to imagine right now a group of American teenagers living here in the U.S., right here in Northern Virginia, suddenly watching their world unravel before their eyes. The comfort of family dinners, the laughter of friends, and the sense of safety and security shattered as an invading force of foreign soldiers storm their streets, their sidewalks, and their homes. They watch as theirs and their neighbors' houses burn to the ground, they watch friends and family members slaughter before their eyes, and and in a wave of terror, they are captured, shackled, and marched thousands of miles away to a foreign empire, a land completely different than their own, a different culture, a brutal culture, and they find themselves in this new place alone with no one but this small group of friends. Everything they know is gone. The pressure to conform is immense. Suddenly they're offered luxuries. The food, the education, everything of the best of that culture and a chance to rise in the ranks. If only they will abandon the faith and the culture of their upbringing. This would give them comfort. This would give them status. But at what cost? In this foreign land, they're surrounded by temptations, the lure of a completely new identity, and now they must make a choice. Will they stand in the beliefs they've had as early as they can remember back in the way that they were raised, or will they compromise and blend into the culture that now holds them captive? And this this was the very choice faced by four young men from a distant time. Sometimes we read these stories. We might have grown up in church, some of us, and heard them in Sunday school, but we don't think about them in our context and what it means for us today. And this powerful story from the book of Daniel has been preserved for us. Pastor Mark's gonna give us more context and overview to this book uh, next week, but we're gonna launch right into the story, all right? So if you have your Bibles or your Bibles on your phone, it'll also be on the screens. We're gonna turn to Daniel chapter one, starting in verse eight. We're gonna read the rest of the chapter in its entirety, and then we're gonna gonna talk through this and, and look at the things that are relevant for us today. It says, but Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank, Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord, the king, who assigned your food and your drink. For why should he see that you were in worse condition than the youths who are of your own age? So you would endanger my head with the king. Then Daniel said to the steward whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Test your servants for 10 days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them in this matter and tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. So the steward took away their food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. As for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. And at the end of the time, when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, 
the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar, and the king spoke with them. And among all of them, none were found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they stood before the king. And in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them 10 times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in all his kingdom. And Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for preserving stories like this for us in this year, 2024, that we can learn from that are so relevant to our, to our current context, where we're tempted by so much compromise, where around us, our culture, Lord, is so captivated by the enemy, blinded by his lies. And we find ourselves in challenging circumstances so often, maybe not to the extreme of these young men, but pressures nonetheless. Lord, help us learn from this story and help us see where you're calling us to take a stand today and how we're called beyond that to thrive in our figurative Babylon. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so first of all, we see the crisis Number one, we see the crisis that these young men find themselves in. We're not going to read, but the opening few verses, seven verses here of Daniel, give the context where these young men are from Jerusalem, and there was a siege that was laid by the Babylonians around this city, and these sieges were, were violent, ugly affairs where many times they'd be forced to starvation, cutting off all outside food sources, sometimes water sources, and so no doubt this had gone on for some time and so in the midst of this then, as, the, as Jerusalem is stormed and these young men watch as everything they know is destroyed, they are captured and now taken to Babylon. They're among the best of the best. They were chosen because of their appearance, because of their knowledge, their education. So no doubt they were from somewhat royal families there in Israel and Jerusalem. And so they were now taken to Babylon. And so don't misunderstand this. This is not um, maybe the, 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 the story here as we read it. It's like, oh, well, they're immediately given access to all of these things. The purpose and intent behind this three years that they were subjected to now was to wipe out their former identity and remold them in the Babylonian way to wipe out all of their identity as Israelites, as Jewish young men, their stories, their songs, their history, their culture, their language, and replace it with this Babylonian identity to increase their value for the empire. This was a three-year indoctrination to completely wipe out their religious roots and transform them. It's a crisis, though, that we can at least relate with. And if you look at this story, if there was ever a time when you read about a setting in which it seems understandable at least that maybe for a time you could just go with the flow, you know what I'm saying? Surely it's this. These are teenagers where everything they know is gone and they're thrust into a situation of great danger because if they don't go along with it, they watched as their family members and friends Many of them were killed. They watched everything they know destroyed. Now they're in a foreign context. What, surely they should just go with the flow in this situation. This would seem to justify it. And we too find ourselves not to this extreme, thank God, at least for those in this room, no doubt in other places, yes, but probably not in this room. But we find ourselves in situations of great pressure at times. Just go along with it. It's not going to hurt anything. Just compromise your convictions this one time. What's the big deal? It will open up new doors of opportunity. Now you'll have influence. Just go with the flow. And so surely we can see how relevant this is for us today. But moving into the, back to the text, it says, it opens this, this section of the story. It says, but Daniel resolved. Daniel resolved. In the face of tremendous pressure, Daniel made a firm decision not to compromise. And what is at the heart of this? Why refuse the king's food and drink? 
The, the, the text doesn't exactly say, okay? But we can, we can draw a couple of things from this that, that are likely. Very likely, the way in which this meat and this wine was prepared was in violation of the dietary laws of the Jewish nation. If you read back in the Old Testament, there was very specific ways in which they were supposed to prepare their meat, for example, to eat. And likely that wasn't being followed. So there was some cultural elements to this of commands from God for the Israelite people of ways in which they were supposed to prepare their food and drink before consuming it. And, and again, likely this was in violation of that. That's one aspect. Another aspect is it's very likely that this food and drink before eating it, maybe in the presence of all of the others, was offered up to Babylonian idols, to the gods of the Babylonians. This was a customary practice. We'd off, they would offer it up and then now we would consume it, right? And so that could have been another factor in their decision as well. They're partaking in the worship of the Babylonian gods and therefore violating their conscience in the worship of the one true God. And then finally, there's this other aspect of the Babylonian culture, which is one, aside from the violence in which they would conquer other lands, was one of indulgence and excess. And you'll see that further in the book of Daniel, these wild parties that they would throw. And since these were the best of the best of these young people, they're given access to everything. No doubt these, these feasts, that they, were, that they were thrown into this environment was one of decadence, was one of, of, one of excess, where people around them were getting drunk and eating in excess, no, no doubt. And so the, these things were probably all factors, but regardless of the exact reasoning for these young men, they felt in the deepest part of their beings, Daniel specifically, that by partaking, they would be compromising, and he resolved not to. See, the king ta king's table represented more than just nourishment. It was participation in a lifestyle that disregarded God's laws. Daniel and his friends refused to assimilate into a culture of excess and idolatry. The same with us. We face these pressures of a culture that's increasingly degenerate, increasingly just, just sort of throwing, you know, just, just throwing things in the face of God, going against everything that he's, commanded. And in the midst of that, we're called to be different and distinct, to stand apart. And so moving on in the text, we see his courageous stand. But I want to point out something, because there's a dangerous line that we can cross as believers, and we can misrepresent our testimony to the world, to the people around us that don't understand why. Okay, if you look at the posture of Daniel and his three friends, specifically the way in which Daniel approaches this caretaker over them, there is not a posture of pride and arrogance if you read the text, all right? There's, there's not this, we're not eating that stuff. That, that there's not this attitude. There's one of petition. There's one of humility. They approach the culture with humility and they say, we can't eat and drink this. They take a courageous stand, but they do so in humility. And I think that's critical for us as believers to recognize in the same way that Jesus on this earth, when he, when he was interacting with those around him, there wasn't this arrogant rebellion. That wasn't the spirit in which they were approaching the authorities over them. It was a respectful petition. Another aspect of this courageous stand is there is, there's a reason, Daniel's not alone. There's three other friends with him. We could call it a cohort, this small community. I'm so thankful that this morning there's so many of us gathered together now and again in another service, and this is one aspect of that community. But I wanna challenge us in taking stands to recognize that doing so alone, isolated from other believers that are also striving by the grace of God to walk with him and stand firm in the convictions he's given them, we need each other. Daniel needed the support of his friends around them, around him. You're gonna see more stories as, as they take various stands throughout the, the, the um, coming chapters. But Daniel wasn't alone. They relied on each other as well. And so Daniel prepare, proposes this test, this 10-day test of eating only vegetables and drinking water, and he trusts God. And God vindicates them. At the end of this 10 days, their appearance was healthier and stronger. And, and there could have been just an aspect of God's miraculous provision here. Again, it doesn't really tell us, 
Or perhaps all of the young people around them were eating and drinking to excess. And you guys know, some of you know the results of and see maybe even with, with others you know, where, where again, you're drinking in excess and you show up, you don't look great the next day, right? And so that could have been an aspect of this as well, that, that just their, their lifestyle along with their choice of food and drink and, and eating and drinking healthy. So God's spirit is here at work. Now, it's not implicit in this, in this story here where it says they paused and they prayed. But later in the story, we know from Daniel's life, as well as these other three friends, we know that they walked with the Lord and they relied on the Lord to the point that it cost Daniel in the future. And he faces further trials because of the stands he takes in, in publicly or just being unashamed in his prayers to God. And so there is a reliance on God in this and, and you see God's hand clearly moving. And, and it's very important to note, not only do we need the support of each other, but we're not taking this stand in our own strength. Their posture is one of humility towards their authority, but also towards the Lord. They need God's grace, and God is the one that blesses them in this circumstance, in this situation. And like Daniel, we need the power of God's Spirit to take a stand. But I want to pause here for a moment, because I think it's easy to gloss over the fact that all of a sudden we jump in the text from the proposed test, where they're only drinking water and eating vegetables and not imagine again the circumstances they're actually in and what they went through in those three years. They got their caretaker, their authority figure over them to agree to this because of the results in their health. But do you think in a public banquet hall with other young people, probably thousands of young people as they're coming together to eat, do you, do you think that went unnoticed? Don't you think they probably developed a reputation in that surroundings. Oh, look, there's the veggie boys again, you know, walking by all the steak, right? And, and no doubt they were poked fun at. They were in this culture for three years where they were distinctly different from the people around them. And because God's hand was on them, they were allowed to do so. But I, I have to believe in this, this context, they were ridiculed, <laughs> made fun of, there was a stand. There's a reason that they're sort of distinct. It's like, oh man, look at those. There's those weirdos again. And sometimes God will call us to take stands where you're gonna be labeled a weirdo. You're gonna be laid, oh man. Look at this, look at this person. But that is what comes with the courageous stands that God calls us to take. And so we come to the climax of this, the blessing of God where God honors their faithfulness and their obedience to the convictions he had given them. I think it's fascinating when you read this text there in, in 17 and onwards here, where it says God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom. And it says they actually had 10 times. It's just, a, you know, it's, a, it's just dramatically more knowledge, dramatically more skill, dramatically more ability within this culture that they'd only had three years to learn than all of the surrounding men, women, people that had been trained from birth onwards. God blessed them so powerfully. I, I think it's interesting to note though, God blessed them specifically in the learning and skills that benefited the Babylonian kingdom. And again, there can be this dangerous line where we sort of, like when, when I talk about being the weirdos in a workplace, which can sometimes happen because you may not, you know, go out and do all the same things or talk about the same things as the people around you. Um, and you may take stands based on convictions God has given you. Um, you know, let's, let's, let's also be careful to not be this, you know, kind of jerk for Jesus where we, where we start to um, not see that we're also called to bless those around us and, and thrive within the culture that we've been placed and bring blessing. And so what we see here is, Daniel and his three friends, this wasn't, this wasn't the Jewish culture per se that was benefiting the Babylonian. There was things I'm sure they were weaving in. You see how strong they were taking the stand. Um, so God's truth, right, is, is shining through them. But it says specifically that this learning and skill in literature and wisdom, this is Babylonian learning and wisdom. They were 
they were compelled and blessed by God to bless the nation around them 10 times above their peers. God used them powerfully. Through this stand they took, God then blesses them in all of their learning and all of their learning of skills and knowledge to now bless the nation. And and I wanna challenge us, all of us, where we are called. Yes, we're called to take stands for Christ and, and maintain his convictions within our lives, but we're also called to thrive and contribute in positive and creative ways. We have a competitive advantage, friends, and sometimes we forget that because we see the one side where we may have to take a stand. But you, if you are a believer this morning, if you have trusted in Jesus Christ for your salvation, the good news is this morning, friends, you have access to the living God. And beyond that, you have the spirit of that living God inside of you, empowering you and giving you unique Ability. See, when Peter talks about, you know, live in such a way that people are compelled to ask of you the hope that's within you, it's even within the circumstance of your workplace, right? Why are you not discouraged by this overwhelming situation? The numbers are so bad, Kim. Why are you not overwhelmed like everyone else? And, and, and perhaps it's because Kim spent that morning in her prayer closet laying it out before God and God's given her strength and resilience and clarity to say, we're gonna press through this situation and come out the other side stronger and better. And and you will be able, by God's grace, within your workplaces and your environments that you're called to, to speak truth in love and to bring courage in the face of great odds against you. And no doubt that's what was happening here. It was beyond just quoting verses or stories from, they were holding on to their heritage, yes, but they were called to thrive. And that's that's the final point this morning from the text, the calling, the thriving that we're called to amidst adversity. You see, they, they weren't just called to survive. In some senses, like we opened up with, surviving would seem enough. If my 15-year-old and 13-year-old and 11-year-old sons were thrust into this circumstance, part of me as a dad would just be like, just survive, get through it and look for an opportunity to, to escape. But that's not God's calling for these young men. God called them to a place of prominence and thriving and contribution to the culture around them while maintaining their convictions. And there was a cost to pay along the way. And there will be more. It wasn't easy But they took that stand and God blessed them and through them blessed the king, this wicked, godless king that one day in the coming chapters God will bring to his knees. God blessed the kingdom through these young men. And that's God's call to us this morning. Yes, to take a stand, but also to thrive. Daniel and his friends, this reality, this resolve, it it foreshadows a greater reality as well. Jesus, we know now, because we can look back and read the gospels, but he would come and he would face the ultimate temptation in the wilderness against the enemy, the devil. And in the same way Daniel and his three friends resisted, this is foreshadowing ultimately our savior coming to this earth and being offered by Satan, a temptation here in the wilderness, right? You can find that in a couple of different gospel accounts, you know, just command this stone to become bread. He'd fasted for 40 days and these various temptations to just grasp power, grasp indulgence. And he resists and quotes scriptures back to the enemy and overcomes. And now because of that, Hebrews 4.15 reminds us he was Jesus tempted in every way and yet without sin. And now because of that reality, we have this access to God that Jesus has opened up. We can see even more clearly than Daniel and his three friends, this access we have to the spirit of the living God to, to empower us. We don't just stand in the victory or the, the, our own strength and what we fight for, but the victory that Christ has won for us on the cross and through his resurrection. So where Daniel looked forward to a coming day, he, he, he gives many pr- prophecies of the, of the coming of Christ and of the future in the coming chapters. We look back to what Jesus has done through the cross and we take our stand in that. 
And as we bring this to a close, I want to read a scripture from 1 Peter chapter 2 to just further clarify this calling we have. Chapter 2, verse 9. It says to us, hear these words this morning, friends. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Friends, we know that Jesus is the only mediator between God and man. And he, he is that great high priest making intercession for you and I right now. And that should give us so much hope. But as Christians, it actually means little Christ. What are we called to be for this world? We're called by his grace and the power of his spirit to represent him. And it says you were called to be this holy priesthood. So in all of the places that you're called, the places of your, your work environment, your school environment, your neighborhoods, wherever you find yourself, yes, you're called to take courageous stands. Yes, you're called to be a blessing, to thrive in that workplace, to do work with excellence. You're also called to be his hands, his feet, his voice, this priest, this, this person that helps connect people to God. And that's the invitation. That's what Daniel and his three friends were called to do. That's your calling. How is God calling you to thrive in this place you find yourself amidst adversity? The three things I want you to recognize and remember as we leave today, as we close out our time, your calling, first of all, as we looked at in 1 Peter, your cohort, we'll call it, this community, this small group of people. The way we do this here at the King's Chapel is we have small groups, all different types of small groups that meet in homes, that meet before service on a Sunday, that meet on a Saturday morning, that meet virtually, that meet in person, but you need community around you. Who are your friends? Who has your back? Who's praying for you during the week? Who do you ask for prayer when you're feeling the pressures mount? And lastly, your courage. The source of this courage is from God's spirit. I wanna remind us of a verse that we looked at quite a bit in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter six. We went through this book over the last months and wrapped this up two weeks ago, but there's a powerful verse here that fits with what the call from God is for us today. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may, may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand firm, stand, therefore. God's invitation to us, like Daniel and his three friends, is to stand in the circumstances, to stand in the convictions that God has given you by his spirit and through his word to stand and be a blessing to those around you, to thrive, to work with excellence, to contribute the absolute best by the spirit and grace of God. And to be that conduit of blessing and, and presence of God to the people around you, to represent him as a priest of God, a person that like Jesus bridges that gap. Jesus is the only one that really bridges that gap, but his spirit through you gets to touch other people through your words, your actions, your encouragement. Let's bow our heads for a moment this morning. Each of you has access to this spirit, but I wanna pause one moment. If you're here this morning and you've never responded to Jesus, you're here this morning and maybe it's these exact pressures that have kept you from standing for Jesus and proclaiming him as your Lord and Savior because you know it will cost you I wanna invite you to respond this morning if you feel that conviction from God's spirit to not hold back, but like Daniel and his three friends, to stand in the grace that God has called you into through Christ. Some of us need to repent because we're believers, but we've been compromising. We have not been faithful to the convictions God has given us. And so we need to repent in areas where We've just gone with the flow. We aren't even facing the level of pressure that Daniel and these three friends did, but 
but we're still compromising. God, forgive us. Let our heart cry be. Look to Jesus this morning who has overcome. This is not a call to stand in your own strength, but to stand in the victory won through Jesus on the cross and through his resurrection. He now invites you into his victory. And before we go back into a time of praise and singing to the Lord, I want to invite some of you. Some of you feel the conviction of the Lord. And this is for you and God. It's not an invitation to come to the front or anything like that, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an invitation to right now in your chairs, stand up. If God is laying on your heart, this workplace environment, this school environment, this community environment, wherever you are, this is between you and the Lord. Right now, I wanna invite you to stand before God and just declare to the Lord, God, I am standing for you. By your grace, I wanna be faithful in the places you've called me. So if that's you, I'm gonna pause a moment here and between you and the Lord, I want you to take that stand. Physically moving your body to stand right now to make a spiritual statement before the Lord. By your grace, God, empower me to stand. Stand in the convictions you've called me to through your words. Stand to be a blessing and a person of excellence in the workplace environment that I've been called to be a blessing to others and to stand as this representative of you to not be ashamed to speak your truth to those around me. Thank you, Jesus. Lord Jesus, I pray for myself standing alongside my brothers and sisters. Lord, you continuously convict me of areas of compromise, whether in my mind, my words, my action. God, I want to be faithful before you. And I pray for each and every brother and sister that physically just stood right now before you, saying, by your grace, I want to stand in this place you've called me, no matter how adverse the circumstances are, no matter what people around me say, I want to stand for you in truth and to be a blessing and a conduit for your spirit. Lord, may we shine your light in every place we're called here in Northern Virginia and the surrounding regions. God, may you blaze your glory through us. May we become that place that's known like a city on a hill. God, where your power radiates and your glory shines, not because of us, but because of you. You are the risen Savior. And for anyone in this place that has not yet trusted in you, may they take that stand this morning, the most important stand to say, you are my Savior, save me. May we repent of where we've failed and where we've fallen, God. May we give it all to you. In Jesus' name.